Good evening. Uh, if everybody could take their seats, we're about to get started. Hi, welcome, welcome. Welcome to the Center for Jewish History. I am Gemma Birnbaum, the Executive Director of the American Jewish Historical Society, and we're so happy to have you here. Uh, we have over 600 people watching online tonight as well. Um, and so thank you to those who are tuning in from home from all over the country. It's so meaningful, especially about uh, a topic like this that maybe a lot of people haven't heard about before. Um, so before we get started, I'm going to first say thank you to our, um, our donor for this event, our sponsor of this event, Dr. Larry Cantor, um, and his wife, Kathy, who are here today. Thank you so much for your support of the American Jewish Historical Society. And just in incredible supporter uh, supporters of, of Jewish history, not just here, but you know throughout this country. And we are just so grateful for for everything that you do for for what what we are trying to do here. Um, so, without uh, further ado, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Larry Kander, who's going to say a few words, and then we'll get started. couple things. We were here a year ago and we were very proud to introduce live lectures uh, right after COVID one year from uh, today. Uh, the other thing is I'm so happy to leave uh, DeSantis, Florida. The politics uh, is, uh, is, is really rough. But uh, we're now here to celebrate Jack Coleman, who this lecture series has made an honor. He was a, an incredible person in the city of Jacksonville. Uh, president of our synagogue, president of a lot of Jewish organizations, also secular organizations. And I make the point that he died just short of 10 years ago, and they sort of say it's three generations before you're, you sort of pass on to history. So he's just in the middle of his first generation. Uh, and so I really uh, am honored to have known him and, and support him. I want to also present Rabbi Merrill Shapiro, who happens to be somebody I've known also for almost for 10 years, who was the founder of the St. Augustine Jewish Historical Society. Uh, and he is not only a, a leader, a mentor, but a friend. I happen to be the vice president of the organization, which famous John Vance Garner said, the vice presidency isn't worth a warm, warm bit of spit, or maybe it uh, had to do with some excrement, excrement but uh, that's, that's what I, he is the man that really does it, does most of the research and has been the uh, founder of the organization. And, and what we hope to bring on, you know, this is the Big Apple, called Jacksonville, maybe the small grape, uh, St. Augustine, maybe the small raisin, but maybe the small raisin will usurp uh, some of New York's oneness. And uh, Rabbi Meryl Shapiro, I bring you to bring that to forefront. Thank you. Uh, please let me begin by thanking, by the way, Gemma and her wonderful staff. Uh, Rebecca and Tamar have been just fabulous, and uh, they are behind the scenes, and so are the sound and the technical people. They have really done a wonderful job, and I'm grateful to all of them. Uh, Pirkei Avot, The Ethics of the Fathers, the Talmudic tractate Avot, uh, says that im ein kemach, ein Torah. If there's no flower, there's no Torah, there's no learning. Flower, that's F-L-O-U-R. And so the flower for today comes, let's see if this will advance. Will it, am I going the wrong way? No, maybe I even should turn it on. There we go. Yeah, so the, the flower to make this happen, of course, comes from Larry Cantor, who here was the Jacksonville community's mensch of the month, but he's a lot more than that. Uh, He's, well, think of those people with the witching sticks to go around and try and find water. He goes around and finds Jewish educational opportunities, uh, Jewish historical studies and so on, and endows them and helps them exist. I have no doubt that if he wanted to, he could have a yacht in each of the seven seas, but instead he's chosen to further the cause of Jewish education and the study of Jewish history here in our country and in our region in the South, and he is truly a gift and a blessing to all of us, especially those of us involved with the St. Augustine Jewish Historical Society. And so his friend Jack Coleman is whom we uh, remember at this time, uh, also a pillar of the Jacksonville Jewish community. 
Yeah, we're out in the Enemies Belt. We're out there. You, you, Jacksonville and St. Augustine are not the end of the world, but you can see the end of the world from there. <laughs> and, but um, we'll in, invite you to come down and we'll show you that in person. Uh, let me take a moment and introduce you to my wife, Robin Shapiro. We happen to have two daughters, our daughter Amy, who lives in the Jacksonville area, and our daughter Sarah, who lives in what we call the free and independent republic of the Upper West Side. Uh, the, the only relevance they have to what we're going to talk about is the fact that Robin and I raised our daughters through their teenage years. And so if you wish to make me feel most comfortable, you'll interrupt me while I'm speaking. And so feel free, you don't have to wait for the Q&A at the end. If you have an inclination to ask a question, by all means, I treasure your questions, your ideas, your thoughts, both during what I'm saying and at the end as well. Don't hesitate. So I'm here representing the St. Augustine Jewish Historical Society. You can look them up, but I'd like you to, as uh, part of the Tourist Bureau in St. Augustine, to say, come on down and see St. Augustine and come and take a look at our 208-foot cross, a gift from the people of Spain to the Diocese of St. Augustine on the 400th anniversary of the founding of the city in 19, uh, 15, so 1965. Uh, now, the Pew Memorial Trust people for the study of religion and American life did a, uh, took a, examined, asked the statistically significant number of Christians what emotion they attached, they thought of when they saw a cross. So I'll ask you, what do you think was the most common emotion that Christians uh, felt when they saw a cross? Sacrifice. Sacrifice, okay, just one possibility. Anybody else? Jesus, Jesus okay, but we got to think of an emotion that's also but true. Jesus, anything else? Suffering. Traumatizing. Uh, by the way, uh, you know what? They also asked the statistically significant number of Jews what they thought, and some of us are projecting our own feelings. Uh, sports fans ought to know. Sports fans ought to know what they chose, because what they the emotion they chose is right there in hold up the sign John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that God gave, that he, that says, gave his only son, that through him we might achieve eternal life. Love is the, what they associate, the, 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 what they think of when they see a cross, the idea of love. And so they, when you ask a statistically significant number of Jews, any, what... Any cross, like a, a, any cross, the idea of a cross, a cross hanging from someone's neck or you know, a 208 foot one and uh, 206, it's on an eight foot pedestal, uh, any cross. And so any cross that a Jew sees, what emotion does it arouse in most Jews? Hmm? Strength? Strength? Distress. Uh, uh, distress, okay, any other? Fear. Fear, by the way, I mean, you've heard this before. Uh, Jews, interestingly, respond by saying they most attach the emotion of fear to the cross. And one of the reasons, one of many reasons, is because of a man like Ferrand Martinez, who in, actually began in uh, uh, probably 1388, but by 1391 uh, was uh, propelled a campaign throughout Spain to convert or to kill the Jews. In fact, long before Martin Luther suggested it, he suggested we should pack all the Jews into their synagogues and set the synagogues on fire. And so it was that he instigated crowds to perpetrate pogroms on the Jews of Spain, of Castile and Aragon and other the, the 
sections of Spain to the point that uh, it's thousands, tens of thousands of Jews, it's disputed, no one's quite sure how many, tens of thousands of Jews were murdered at the instigation of Ferran Martinez. By the way, historians questioned whether he was even literate. He may not have been literate, yet he could still arouse in the population a hatred of Jews who, after all, were responsible for deicide. They killed God. What, after all, could kill the omnipotent force for good in the world except the omnipotent force for evil, the association of the devil and Satan with the Jews actually is found in the book of John chapter 8. And so uh, many Jews decided they could save themselves by converting. Uh, rather, uh, some flee, fled, some converted. Uh, now there were several different ways in which they could convert. Uh, they could do so, well we'll talk about that, the, those who uh, converted were practice, some of them were practicing Judaism in secret, so they were called Muranos, and the source of that name is open the question. Uh, we talked for a minute before that has to do with swine and is a pejorative. Uh, I'll introduce you later to Ben Sion Netanyahu, the father of the current prime minister of Israel, who says it's from the Hebrew word Yamir. Those of you who know uh, Yigdal, the low Yamir Dato, will not push aside, that they pushed aside their Judaism. Others say, by the way, the term Muranos was used by Jews who pointed to those other Jews who had converted and called them swine. It's open the question. They're also called anusim, the Hebrew word for forced ones and becoming more popular. Nuevo Cristianos, they were new Christians or conversos or crypto Jews, uh, many different means. They, some of them, by the way, became sincere Catholics. Someone from the Carvajal family who we'll uh, meet in just a little while, uh, in fact, became a cardinal and was being considered as a successor to the papacy, and his roots were, of course, Jewish. Uh, they, uh, some became sincere Catholics, others practiced their Judaism in secret, uh, and many ultimately fled first from Spain to Portugal, and then the Iberian Peninsula to the point that the, in the decade after the expulsion in 1492, the largest population of Jews lived in what city in the world? Anybody know? Amsterdam, Salonika, Greece, okay? They went that far east. And so it is that, uh, here's Ben Sion Netanyahu, but his son speaks English well enough because he was a long-term professor at Jopsy College in uh, Philadelphia, but he came to the United States to teach at Cornell, actually. Uh, B.B. is a graduate, by the way, of Cheltenham High School in Philadelphia, for those, any people from their city of brotherly love. And Sion Netanyahu is the head of a group of scholars, or was a head of a group of scholars who died 10, 12 years ago, who believe that these people didn't care about their Judaism when they were Jews, and so they didn't care about their Catholicism when they became Catholics either. It just didn't matter at all. And then there is what I would regard the uh, teacher of my teacher, uh, Chaim Beinart, who said, no, those people who hid their Judaism thought that and felt as though they were saving Judaism for a future generation. They looked around and from what they knew, Judaism was on the verge of disappearing, that there would be no Jews and no Judaism ever again. And Chaim Beinart says these are heroes. So you have to decide whether they're heroes or whether they didn't care about their religion or they were heels. Uh, his, Jewish history is not a spectator sport. You, I urge you to look into this and make up your mind whether you're on Chaim Barnard's side or on Ben Sion Netanyahu's side. And uh, I'll give you my email address. You can tell me what you think after you do your homework. Uh, now, one of the features of these converts is, and one of the unusual features of Judaism, and Jews almost everywhere, perhaps even here in the United States, it's disappearing is a cultural, uh, aff not an affectation, it's more an element of our culture, is a high degree of literacy. You know, we are very literate. And so Jews who, as Jews, rose to the highest 
uh, level of society in Spain uh, became Catholics and they still rose to the highest level and took very important roles in the cultural, social, uh, even military life of Spain. And so the old Christians, the traditional Catholics of Spain, uh, called upon uh, both the Pope and the Crown to institute a, and I'm, my pronunciation of Spanish is not very good, limpieza de sangre, uh, a purity of blood statute. Uh, very important. Many jobs, many positions, uh, even many places. To live there, you had to prove that you were pure bred old Christian, a Catholic, and that you had no Jewish blood, and by the way, no Moorish, no Muslim blood either. Uh, this will figure importantly, uh, let's, let's see if I can go back here. Uh, when we look at the activity of a man by the name of Pedro Menendez de Avila, uh, a, a Spanish admiral, a, a great navigator, uh, was uh, instrumental in bringing the family of the crown to England so that uh, I believe it was King Henry could marry Mary Tudor, the daughter of Henry VIII. Uh, he was widely respected. It is he who made a deal with King Philip II and said, I'm going to establish a settlement on the shores of Florida. And King Philip said, if you do, You'll have to pay 20% of your, the money you reap to the crown. You can keep the other 80%. And you pay the people, and you, that, that you're in charge. It's, it's a business of yours. And so Menendez prepared to sail to, ultimately to Florida. Uh, but before he left, there was a discovery that the French were at the mouth of what was the May River, now called the St. John's River in where Jacksonville and where it flows to the sea. And so the king helped to underwrite uh, the venture as well and included a significant military uh, component to Menendez's fleet of ships that sailed from uh, 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 Cadiz. Well, all right, let's, here's the, hang on one second, that's okay. At the south of your map, you'll see the city of Cadiz. Uh, Hebraists will know that Cadiz and Gadera are the same word, then uh, the ships sailed from Cadiz. Actually, they sailed down the Guadalquivir River from Seville to Cadiz and then to the New World uh, by way of the Canary Islands. Then Hispaniola and uh, Pedro Menendez de Avila meets with the younger Ponce de Leon in Puerto Rico and then on to Florida. Uh, by the way, Guadalquivir River, the word Guad, is the same as the Hebrew or Arabic word wadi. It's a river, wadi is a guada canal, is the, the wadi, the river of the canal guada uh, lupe is the river of wolves and, and so on. Uh, so he wants to come to Florida to establish what will ultimately become St. Augustine, for as you notice, the fleets that uh, are mining silver and other valuables from the Spanish main all generally would f go through the Straits of Bahama and uh, off of St. Augustine would catch the Gulf Stream and make their way to Europe. And so Saint, a place like St. Augustine would become the final stop. And in fact, to this very day, when you come to St. Augustine, I'll take you for a walk on Treasury Street that it runs directly from the harbor and where the heavily guarded casks of silver were brought to a safe place while the fleet was replenished, then returned to the fleet and sent back to Spain. Uh, so uh, Pedro Menendez de Avila sails from Cadiz, uh, right there between the, uh, the bus station and the cruise ship dock. Uh, and on, in July of 1565, and interestingly, immediately goes north and then south to around the Fort St. Sebastian. Uh, let's see if I can, if you see, it says San Sebastian over here. There's a fort. And when he sails with his fleet of seven ships that are going to come to the New World and found this colony, uh, he reports contrary winds that blow him back to San Sebastian. There overnight, 
various witnesses report. This came out in a later trial when they thought uh, that Pedro Menendez de Avila was bringing into Spain silver that remained untaxed. There he had contact with the shore and anywhere between 150 and 300 undocumented individuals came aboard his ships to sail to the New World. Uh, by the way, undocumented because of the question of who was paying them we have a list, and I'll be happy to share it with anybody, of almost 1,800 people who were on those ships who came to the New World and who was paid by the king and who was paid out of Pedro Menendez de Avila's profits. And so we know who they are. The question is why uh, Dr. Eugene Lyon, who studied this and studied, found all this information in the Archives General of the Indies, why would these people want to come off the books? And the realization is that they could not have passed the test of limpieza de sangre. People who did not have pure Christian blood were not allowed to come to the new world. And these people had Jewish roots and therefore could come off the books and uh, sail with Menendez. Please, go ahead. That's the second time you mentioned purity of blood. Right. The test was genealogy, and by the way, we see, in fact, there are several books of genealogies. Actually, someone actually tries to prove that even the king had Jewish blood, and the whole idea was foolish. Uh, and by the way, Ignatius of Loyola, later in St. Augustine, I won't cover it here, uh, we have the issue of Jesuit missionaries and Franciscan missionaries. Jesuits spring forth from uh, a movement started by Ignatius of Loyola, who said, Limply as a de sangre, that would mean that even Jesus himself couldn't come to the new world, so not so good. But they had to present a genealogy. By the way, if you want to get married in Israel these days, you also have to present a genealogy and prove that you are Jewish the very same way. So Dr. Lyon suggests that these people perhaps uh, were taken off the books because they could not pass the test to come to the new world. And uh, uh, he's important because we, actually, we have the St. Augustine Jewish Historical Society interviewed at length Dr. Lyon in his, the living room of his home in Vero Beach, Florida before he passed away. Uh, and so we believe that conversos, Jews, actually sailed with Menendez. Did they make it the whole way? Menendez, uh, in truth, uh, half of his ships disappear in a hurricane. Uh, he makes his way to Hispaniola, and then on, at where he could have dropped off some of these people onto Puerto Rico, as I mentioned. He could have dropped off some of them as well. Some of them may have come to Florida because Pedro Menendez de Avila finally brings his fleet and the people on board to the area of St. Augustine, Florida on August the 28th, 1565. And I caution you, and I'll I'll show you later, that's the Julian calendar, not the Gregorian calendar. By the way, anybody here ever note or hear that, Abraham, that George Washington was actually born on the 12th of February and not the 22nd? Does that sound familiar? That's because of the difference between the Julian calendar and the Gregorian calendar that we use today. There's a 10-day difference. So Menendez cites the territory of Florida on August the 28th, 1565, the anniversary of the, the Feast of Augustine in the Atlantic, there's a place called Mayport, it happens to be the home of the, of, uh, the aircraft carrier, the JFK, uh, and he engages them, but then drifts downward and old, southward, uh, and here comes to the inlet of St. Augustine, uh, by the way, and, and the Jewish history of St. Augustine is extensive, uh, extensive enough that at the top center of this map, you see the earliest fort that was there that today is the uh, Casa de Saint Marco, Castillo de Saint Marco, the uh, fort of Saint Mark that is famous for a variety of reasons. One of them is that it was a place of incarceration of Christopher Gadsden, who was uh, captured by the British and uh, out of the, after the siege of Charleston, South Carolina in 17, uh, 1780, and it was incarcerated here. Uh, we're most interested, you know him, by the way, because he created a flag 
And in that flag, he took a trope from the book of Numbers about Nachash on the Choshet, the bronze serpent. He made a flag that has it in a coiled serpent, and under it he said, don't tread on me. That's the Gadsden flag. But he made it clear in his diary, while he was incarcerated there, he learned Hebrew. So if you want to help our research, come and help us find who taught him Hebrew in 1780 here in St. Augustine. Uh, so this is what uh, Pedro Menendez de Avila find. He chooses not to land, as I said, on the uh, 28th, but instead waits until encounters the French and ultimately, let's see if I get the right direction, uh, waits until September the 8th to come aboard. Now we asked Eugene Lyon and others why those 10, 11 days passed before Saint, he landed and established St. Augustine. Uh, some say there was a storm. By the way, there's an argument about whether it was a northeaster or whether it was a hurricane. Uh, or does he want to engage the French? Or is he waiting those 10 days because August 25th of 1565, on the Julian calendar, you could add 10 days and make it the Gregorian calendar, happens to be what we call Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah. And so, interestingly, he waits 10 days, the 10 days of repentance, till after Yom Kippur. Now, is Pedro Menendez de Avila or the people with him, are they Jewish? Perhaps yes, perhaps no. Perhaps they simply had a tradition that on the new moon, Closest to the autumnal equinox, we just don't start new endeavors. We wait 10 days. It does wait until the day after what would be Yom Kippur to set foot on the soil of Florida and establish St. Augustine, Florida. Uh, so here's the Gregorian calendar that uh, came into effect in 1582. You see that October begins with Monday 1, Tuesday 2, Wednesday 3, you don't need me, but Thursday the 4th is followed by Friday the 15th. 10 days are added, so if you're uncomfortable with the idea of Rosh Hashanah befalling on August the 25th, you can understand that that's the Julian and not the Gregorian calendar. Uh, so Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur account for those 10 days. Now further, including this, and this is a plaque that's found on the, this Mission Nombre de Dios where this 208 foot cross is, uh, this map lists most of but not all of the 66 Spanish missions that are found in Florida. Uh, and some of the missions predate St. Augustine, but they're failed and they, people disappeared or got back on boats and left and went someplace else. All of them are named either for the Indian tribe they served or for a saint or an event in the life of Jesus. So they're all either for an Indian tribe, for a saint, or for an event in the life of Jesus, except for one. And that one is Mission Nombre de Dios, the mission there in Florida, in St. Augustine, Florida, with that 208-foot cross. So why is it called Nombre de Dios? And by the way, you can ask anybody, scholars, in every which way, and scholarly articles have been written why this mission is called Nombre de Dios. No one comes to a satisfactory conclusion unless you suggest that Nombre de Dios, in fact, the name of God, the pronunciation of the ineffable name of God is something that occurred when the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, entered Kodesh HaKadashim, entered the Holy of Holies, and pronounced Nombre de Dios, the, the name of God, on one day a year on Yom Kippur. Go ahead, please. Yeah, the, the number of nations set up by Father, I forget his name, on the West Coast, yeah. is very limited, it's like six. Right. Okay, the west coast of Florida, uh, by the way, was explored mainly by Hernando de Soto, but all those, all those uh, missions and all those, uh, any attempt at settling that area led to failure. In fact, uh, uh, what? Uh, yeah, yeah, and they come later, but 
the, there is success at St. Augustine that's not found along the Gulf Coast. And in fact, there are some communities uh, that we discovered, uh, that have been discovered, not necessarily by us, that, where they settle on the west coast of Florida, Tampa, Sarasota, and, and further north, uh, that failed. And we find people who know that Nuevo España, that New Spain, and Mexico are to the west, and they literally try to walk from Sarah, what today is Sarasota, Florida, to Mexico City and Monterey and so on. Uh, obviously, they don't make it, but we discovered that that's what they're trying to do. So none of those are successful. Only St. Augustine is successful. Now, in 1934, uh, there's somebody who was sent to Nombre de Dios to plant a row of hedges. And so they're digging to plant hedges, and they come up with human remains. Immediately in 1934, they call the Smithsonian Institute. The Smithsonian Institute comes down and discovers that there are large numbers of burials of Native Americans in that area. Except confusingly, as is noted on the website of the uh, 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 Museum of Natural History of Florida, uh, confusingly, there are two different configurations. Some of these burials are in a traditional Catholic burial in which the people are buried in graves around the chapel with their feet facing the cross so that when the second coming occurs, when Jesus returns, they can come out of their graves and go directly to the cross on the altar in the church. On the other hand, they also find lots of graves in which the uh, people are oriented with their feet facing towards the east. And nobody understood why. And we asked, didn't you have any Jews who looked at this? Because the traditional Jewish way of burial is to bury with our feet towards the land of Israel. And in Israel, to bury with our feet towards the Jerusalem, and in Jerusalem to bury with our feet facing towards the Temple Mount, so that when, for us, the Messiah comes the first time, we would come out of our graves and go directly to the Temple Mount. And so we believe that somebody knew that story when they arranged that alternate burial of Native Americans not facing the cross in the chapel. And we need to remember that Christopher Columbus, all the way to the Mormon church today, even Mitt Romney, believes strongly that those Native Americans are, in fact, Jews, the 10 lost tribes of Israel. By the way, they are not the 10 lost tribes of Israel. They are not. The 10 lost tribes of Israel aren't even lost. But the 10, they believe they were Jewish, and so they buried them in a Jewish manner. We would love to find out who was the person who told them that, but it seems as though somebody knew that these were uh, Jews who, they were rooted in Judaism, which again is not true. By the way, this is an era of an important millennialism, that is a belief that Jesus will return. By the way, Jesus didn't return in the year 1000, that occasioned the Crusades of Europe. Jesus didn't return in the year 1500, but the year 1666 was soon more or less to come. That is the year 1000, the thousand years of Jesus, and add to it the years 666. Go take a look at the book of Revelations and you'll find the significance of 666. And that may mean something as well. Thus, missionaries were sent to convert these people who actually were Jews in their mind to Christianity. And once the Jews were converted, then and only then would the second coming occur. Uh, now comes to the St. Augustine Jewish Historical Society, Professor Roger Martinez of uh, uh, Colorado State, Uni uh, University of Colorado at Colorado Springs. He does an extensive study of the Carvajal family. Now, the Carvajal family were old Christians. There's no question about it. Uh, by the way, if you go to the Lisbon phone book, I don't know if they have phone books anymore in Lisbon, but you'll see pages and pages of Carvajals. And there are Carvajals here in the United States. They abound. The Carvajals intermarried with the family of Rabbi Solomon Halevi of Burgos. Rabbi Solomon Halevi of Burgos, however, changed his family name, because he wanted to hide the fact that he was Jewish, to Santa Maria. 
as we have a member of the uh, leadership of uh, St. Augustine Jewish Historical Society, would say he would have changed his name to Epstein or Rappaport, but you can't hide as a Jew if your name is Epstein or Rappaport. And so he took the name Santa Maria. The Santa Maria family from the 12th and 13th century slowly intermarried with the Carvajal family so that Rancho Martinez says by 1410, all Carvajals were of Jewish descent. By the way, uh, Jews during the time of Oliver Cromwell were uh, allowed to become citizens of uh, England, and the first indenizen that's called Jew in England was a Carvajal. The viceroy of New Spain, of much of Mexico, leading into southern Texas as well, was uh, uh, Luis de Carvajal. Uh, it, it's a very common name, and we discover that there are, in fact, Carvajals in St. Augustine as early as September the 8th, 1565. If you look at, uh, let's see if I can do this again. Uh, see that anyway. If you, uh, one, two, the third row, the fourth row, uh, second from the right uh, is Antonio de Carvajal. We know that Antonio Martinez Carvajal was on the muster of the people who came with uh, Pedro Menendez de Avila, and we have reason to believe that he was the first Jew to arrive in what would become the United States in the year 1565. In fact, uh, September 8th, 1565, 89 years before Jews set foot in here in Manhattan. And so we happen to enjoy tweaking the nose of our sisters and brothers in New York City that Jews came first to St. Augustine in 1565. Please, go ahead. Oh, uh, sorry, I, I don't need that. Thank no, you. Okay. Yeah, because well, people need to hear. Weren't there Jews associated with the Christopher Columbus voyage as well? Uh, with, with Columbus? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, I refer you to the work of Estelle Irizarry, head of the Hispanic Studies Department, the late of the Hispanic Studies Department of Georgetown University, who has convincing evidence that Columbus himself was Jewish, but never set foot in what would become the United States. So yes, um, by the way, at all this time, there are many Jews throughout the islands in the Caribbean and many Jews working in silver in, uh, the, in me what today is Mexico. And in fact, even before this time, it appears that the first printing press was brought to Mexico by a Jew who then proceeded to create some type of newspaper. So yes, there were Jews, not in what was the United States though. All right, perhaps you could clear this up for me. You had said that uh, the forefather of all this was a Jewish rabbi, but he did convert. Yes. So therefore, these Kavahal people uh, really came from a convert. So they weren't Jews at that point, they were Christians. Okay, so we have to decide here what the definition of a Jew is. And that's quite a task, and we agree. In fact, can we count some of these people as Jewish? if they took communion at the local Catholic church last Sunday? And we have to argue that. So we can say that these people are of Jewish descent, if not actually Jewish. Okay? And we find the same as beyond the scope of what we're doing, and St. Augustine was the home, of course, of David U. Lee, who was either the first Jew to sit in the U.S. Senate or the first person of Jewish descent. The question is whether he converted before he married the daughter of the governor of Kentucky or whether he maintained his Judaism, but he's not buried in a Jewish cemetery. He doesn't seem to be Jewish. So we have Jews uh, who are Jewish of Jewish descent, and then we have Jews. And that's a difficult question to answer, absolutely. Uh, something we have to struggle with. Uh, by the way, uh, there are Jews by culture, there are Jews by nationality, and there are Jews by religion. Uh, nature of Jewish identity, complicated question, but your observation is correct, absolutely. And, and so, uh, anyway, so this Antonio de Carvajal, we believe, is the first Jew to have set foot in the United States, the first person of Jewish descent. Now, the, um, okay, please, Paul, go ahead. 
name of the professor who studied Jews with Columbus? Again, what was her name? Uh, Estelle Irizari. I-R-I-Z-A-R-Y. -I -I be in touch with me. I'll be happy to tell you. Uh, her book is the DNA of Columbus's writings. Columbus was a prolific writer, and she looks at his language and his use. By the way, she believes that he told the story that he was from Genoa uh, to cover the fact that his native tongue was Ladino, and, but he couldn't admit that it was Ladino, and chose the name Genoa because, and I don't know the Italian or the Spanish, if you say, I am from Genoa, I'm a Genovese, and then rearrange the letters, it says, I navigate. And so, but I urge you to read the book of, by Estelle Rosari. I'll be happy to provide you with that information. Uh, other questions? Okay, so uh, one thing I will say, however, about Antonio Martinez Carvajal, and it comes from uh, uh, somebody who was uh, an officer and part of this uh, August organization at one time, uh, and it was a camper of mine at Camp Rama 100 years ago, uh, Professor Jonathan Sarna. And Jonathan Sarna will quote a professor of his who says, if you find the first Jew in any given locale, you can be sure there's always one before it. And, and so it, we found somebody who was here September 8th, 1565. Was there somebody before it? We don't know. But again, Jews set foot on the island of Manhattan in September, the first week of September in 1654, 89 years later. Uh, uh, so it, uh, we know that Carvajal was also the, a master harbor pilot, which may have connected him with Luis de Carvajal in Mexico, who wanted to extend the reach of the Spanish main. And uh, he was one of three Carvajals who were in the uh, 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 contingent that came with Pedro Menendez de Aviles. This is a card catalog note of a letter that uh, Antonio Martinez Carvajal from St. Augustine or from Havana, it's not clear, uh, writes to King Philip and wants to be reimbursed for his expenses uh, being a harbor pilot and helping to unload ships, particularly in a place like St. Augustine, where a bar, a sandbar, uh, prohibited larger ships from coming across the harbor. That is until it was blown up by the Army Corps of Engineers in 1947. I'll be glad to show you that place as well. Uh, and then Dr. Stanley Hortis, who was a, a Jew, who was at one time the uh, state historian of New Mexico, Mexico calls and says, uh, do you have uh, on your list anybody named uh, De Paez? I say yes, and he says, oh, well, I have evidence here that De Paez appealed to the authorities to have a waiver to Limpieza de Sangre, and that he was, in fact, Jewish. By the way, he was a slave trader who comes to St. Augustine uh, in the uh, 1570s and uh, is yet more evidence of the presence of Jews. We just don't know how many they were. They were Muranos, they were Anusim, they were crypto Jews, they were hidden. Uh, we once thought to have some kind of ceremony or service on Mission Nombre de Dios. In memory of the Jews who might also have been buried there, the diocese said, that's no problem. All you have to do is submit evidence that there are in fact Jews there. And we said, well, if evidence existed, then they were sent to the inquisitional courts in uh, Mexico or in Colombia or in in Peru and burned at the stake. So it's awfully hard to find evidence 450 years later. So uh, th here's the story of Dr. of Dr. Hortis and the Paez family. Uh, we will have more. He doesn't want to share it until he publishes his paper. So we'll have to wait until he publishes his paper. But let me for one moment uh, explain what's going on and then with this we'll stop. La Leyenda Negra, the black legend. It, uh, there were many years years of war, many comp much competition between the British and the Spanish, and so the British began a system of uh, uh, anti-Catholic and anti-Spanish uh, propaganda, convincing that the Spanish are, uh, have uh, developmentally delayed problems, that they are uh, dumber than everybody else, that they are pagan, that they are terrible, and that they are awful people. And so we are examining whether that has filtered down to us. Because we find that so many Jewish institutions in our world today seem to suffer from what's called Ashka-centricity. 
that is, uh, that Ashkenazim are the center of the world and that other Jews are not. And we forget that there's a sizable population. By the way, even with the development in the history of the modern state of Israel, it's clear that Ashkenazim didn't think much about Sephardim. And by the way, Sephardic Jews, for many good reasons, didn't think much of Ashkenazim as well. And we need to overcome those barriers to help us understand these and understand, more importantly, our own biases in the uh, uh, in understanding the entire history of Spanish Jewry, and particularly here in the New World. And so we in the uh, St. Augustine Jewish Historical Society are propelled by the verse in Deuteronomy that says, uh, if your dispersion be even to the very ends of the earth, you will be gathered up and you will be brought back. You see, once again, we are dealing with people who went to their deaths thinking that Jews and Judaism were done, were over. The Inquisition, the, uh, the courts, the trials, the, the suppression of Jewish identity would destroy Judaism. And that's what they thought. And our job, and I ask you to join us as well, involves the repatriation of the souls of these people. We are repatriating Jewish souls, and we can literally take you to their graves when, and you can stand there when you come and say hello to me and to the others of the St. Augustine Jewish Historical Society. We'd love to have you around. You can contact me for any questions, and I'd be happy to answer them, just as I'd be happy to answer your questions right now as well. So I thank you again for this opportunity, but if there are questions, and I know that somebody has got a laptop who's got questions from home as well. Uh, please raise your hand because we have somebody with a mic who will come over so you can be heard by those who are at home. Okay. Uh, wait, oh, okay, go ahead. The question is a tangent, but you mentioned the Spanish main, and the main is what? The currents, uh, the winds, or the, the, well, let's the go back to that dominion map. of Spain? The, the Spanish main is thought to be associated with the Spanish mainland. And let's go back here. So it's all this area from Florida around the Gulf of Mexico, all of which is Spanish-speaking places. Okay, so this is all Spain. Spain saw it, by the way, even today, the, Mexico is a major source of silver and silver was being shipped in great quantities back to Spain. And the king and the people of Spain were very happy to have these riches, and they wanted to protect them. Uh, privateers, the French and Corsairs and so on, would raid there, the, and so that propels the establishment of St. Augustine. Yeah. I understand that the Holy Office had no jurisdiction over Jews, right. just over conversos. Yeah. And a lot of what they did was promulgated by the Dominicans and the Franciscans who were founded as inquisitors. Did, did this inquisition and this, and this passage to the new world, right. was it the same in, in, in Florida and in Mexico as it was in South yeah. America? Yeah. Did they, they did the exact same thing. Uh, they did the exact same thing, uh, except, by the way, that it included the Indians, the Native Americans, who they thought uh, were Jewish as well. For those who don't understand, the Inquisition was an inquiring into the genuineness of the conversion of those Jews who converted to Catholicism beginning 1391 or so. The church had no authority over those who remained Jews. And so the answer was found when the confessor to Queen Isabella, who, Ferdinand and Isabella, who, by the way, was descended from Jews, his name was Tomas Torquemada, convinced the crown and the pope to allow the expulsion of Jews. So if we expel Jews, all we have left are insincere converts. The Inquisition will get them. Do, uh, who's got the mic? Oh, okay. All right. Now, we have this group of uh, practicing Jews who could either convert or they be outwardly convert and practice Catholicism or go undercover and uh, have some practices in hiding, but on the surface are uh, oh, right. Christians. Well, what, what is the incentive for them to go to uh, Florida 
If they're going to be hidden, they're hidden, so they may as well stay hidden in Spain. Why make this big trip to Florida and still not outwardly identify as Jews? Okay, so the church publishes a list, and it says on this list, if your neighbors happen to do laundry and put on clean clothes on Friday afternoon or Friday evening, they might be Jews. By the way, these are the ancestors of Jeff Foxworthy. Uh, that, who's that, you, know, you, you, might be a, uh, you might be a redneck if, uh, if your uh, neighbors happen to light candles on Friday evening, uh, they might be Jewish, so you need to turn them in. If your neighbors don't eat leavened bread, on the, you know the starting with the full moon after the autumn after the vernal equinox, then they might be Jews. And most interestingly, if your neighbors are literate, they might be Jews. And so, because of that constant looking into the private behavior of Jews, Jews wanted to get to as far away from the center of the empire as they possibly could. And once again, Florida was it. Florida had no silver, no riches. All Florida had, they report, are alligators and snakes and poison plants and bugs. And so nobody wanted to go to Florida. So some Jews said, aha, if I go to Florida, I can escape this pressure from the Inquisition and the forces of the expulsion in the church. Yeah? Good. So <clears throat> in other words, if you can read this pamphlet, you're probably Jewish. Yeah, you know, exactly. But, but also, uh, the, um, I think, I don't know what they call it. As people, uh, as I learned in high school, I think, the Indians were called Indians because they thought they were in India. Uh, yeah, right, they were called in, exactly. So they thought the people in India were Jewish? Uh, no, they thought that, they, well, it didn't take too long to discover that this was not India. Yeah, that's number one. And they had some, you know, the, the Silk Route, the, they had some experience with the, the, the Columbus, right, Columbus called them Indians, and that name stuck. But in the end, they seem to be native indigenous people of the North American continent. And where, who, how did they get there? Well, they must fit in the biblical scheme of things. This is the church, this is religion, and this is also you know, the tail end of the Dark Ages and the medieval times. And so, so what do we explain? How do we explain these people? They must be the 10 lost tribes of Israel. Yeah? Good. Rabbi. What do you all know, the professors in, in the historical society know about the um, uh, religious organizations, synagogues, for example? Mm. If, if they were Jews in hiding, did they try? Do you have any evidence of, of the many thousands of them trying to start, not churches, but synagogues or places that they could oh. go? Okay, so, yeah. so the question of the return of Jews who practice Catholicism to Judaism is a, a popular and an important one. Uh, I would uh, refer you to the Society for Crypto-Judaic Studies and their scholarly publications, uh, but they cite a Talmudic dictum that says, Yehudi shato'e Yehudihu, that is, a Jew who in error or in some way is forced and not on purpose begins to acquire Christian customs is still a Jew. But by the way, there are others, and you can imagine who they are, who insist that, well, if you're a crypto Jew, by the way, this goes on in New Mexico and Arizona and the Southwest United States all the time, and some places in Florida and the Southeast as well, that Jews come and say, you know what? I remember my grandmother every Friday night going into a closet and lighting two candles. I think I might be Jewish. And, or I remember this custom or that custom and so on. By the way, I remember the, uh, the centrality of Purim because the first crypto Jew, of course, was Queen Esther. You know, Queen Esther hid the fact that she was Jewish and went into the uh, harem of Ahasuerus. And, and so they, they come today and say, I want to be Jewish. And some rabbinic authorities, and you, this is a spectrum from the left to the right, some rabbinic authorities will take them back as Jews immediately. 
and uh, one of these returning Jews and, and nine long existing Jews make a minion, and others will say, no, they have to undergo conversion as well. And so that's a, that's a question of the nature of Jewish identity and the community that wants to accept these people as Jews. Absolutely. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I was told at a meeting by a Christian from the country of Costa Rica, San Jose, the capital, is in the center of the country, and it's up high on a mountain. And it was founded by Jews mm -hmm. who could see the Atlantic and the Pacific, Pacific at the same time from Costa Rica. Uh, right. from San Jose, yeah. and therefore they practice their Judaism, but if they saw the Inquisition coming, they can move away uh, from uh, it. They, they could put away their Jewish things and take a, put away your candlesticks and your Hanukkah menorah and take out a cross and so on. You, go, uh, right? you know the story in the, the, the book, uh, The Mezuzah and the Madonna's Foot, are you familiar with, uh, am, about a Jew who uh, is an, a Jew in hiding and wants to look outwardly as a good Catholic, so he ha gets a Madonna, a statue, and puts it in his courtyard, hollows out the big toe, and slips in a mezuzah. And so all the neighbors report, oh, what a good person he is. Every time he comes home, he kisses the toe of the Madonna. And the, you know, we know he's kissing the mezuzah. To them, he's kissing the foot of the Madonna. Um, and I do and this a, kind of behavior is common. Go ahead. Um, I do have a question from online quickly. Um, were any Jewish material items such as a mezuzah found in St. Augustine dating back to this historical period? Uh, and we would love to say that there were, but in fact there were none, because anybody caught with them would then be referred to an inquisitional tribunal. So there was, you could, if you had a mezuzah, if you had anything Jewish, you could be put to death for possessing it at certain times during the course of the Inquisition. And I was talking to, to somebody, the Inquisitional courts were active at times uh, for people in St. Augustine, but they, the courts actually met in places like Havana, again, uh, Mexico, Mexico City, Cartagena and, and uh, Colombia, and uh, uh, Lima in Peru. So once upon a time, uh, somebody to protect St. Augustine from hurricanes makes an effigy of Jesus and puts it right there or on the sand at the waterfront, and the next door neighbor says, you don't think that's gonna do any good, that's a bunch of baloney and hooey. Well, the next day, that man was referred to the uh, uh, inquisitional courts and taken away and sent someplace we don't know where and tried for heresy and blasphemy and so on. Um, so I think we have time for just one more question. This has okay. been such a great uh, back and forth. Uh, fine. Now, again, you have my information, and or you can get it from the staff here. I have some cards if you'd like. I'll be happy to take your questions anytime. We'll make this the last okay. public question. So from your vast storage of knowledge, when, who, uh, excuse me, who were the first practicing acknowledging Jews, uh, when did they come to the United States and who were they? Okay. These are people who were definitely Jewish in thought, practice, etc. You've caught me tweaking the nose of the Jewish community of New York. Uh, there is no question that in New York, in New Amsterdam in 1654, you did have a group of Jews who were practicing as Jews. Established, by the way, the first element that any Jewish community establishes is, anybody know? What's the first Jewish institution in the community? Hmm? Okay, a cemetery. A cemetery, and if they can, a mikvah. And then a synagogue. You can always pray in somebody's, you know, in somebody's house, hut, or outdoors. Uh, but uh, yeah, the first, the, what we have in St. Augustine, we wouldn't call a Jewish community. And again, their identity was suppressed. It wasn't their fault, but it was a suppression of their Jewish identity. Uh, but they left, left us hints, and I've presented, I hope, the hints, that they were, in fact, Jewish in some manner, shape, or form. So Amsterdam was the first New Amsterdam? New, new, Amst new Amst oh, the first, uh, I'm talking about New Amsterdam, here in New York, okay? here in the city of New York. Okay, but again, that happens in 1654. The, the events I'm talking about happen in 1565. Again, I thank you. Mm. 
you can always feel free to be in touch uh, and uh, come down to St. Augustine. We'd be happy to show you around. There's a lot more to the Jewish history of St. Augustine. It's the place of the largest mass arrest of rabbis ever at the behest of Martin Luther King in 1964. It is the place where David Uli, Moses Elias Levy, bought 400,000 acres between St. Augustine and Ocala and said, Jews of the world, come. And six families came, and this would be the new homeland. His son, David Uli, first Jewish senator in the United States Senate, many other aspects of Judaism. Uh, 